Okay. Well, I'll just mosey on in here. Sit down. Take a sip from my tea. Mmm. Tonight's tea is organic peppermint. Great for your digestion. Boom! Hey, got ya. I'm Thundercloud. Here at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame, washing away the garbage, leaving rainbows after rains. Right, tonight on Chillin' Tuesdays, fun and linguistic games. What am I doing? I've, I'm reading the poetry of uh, John McCauley and uh, his father, Bill. Yeah. Well, one of the things that happen here, some of the things that randomly happen here at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame is people come in and, and try some of my awesome Bastion Lane coffee from the Yukai Post Office over there in Yukai. Uh, mm. Yeah, and um, this uh, fellow, John McCauley, popped in with his wife Lynn just the other day. What's today? Uh, Sunday was, yeah, it's Monday, it's Tuesday, yeah, so they come in on Sunday and he's um, left me. They came for coffee and he said, oh, I write poetry and I got my books here. And, and so he gave me a copy of his book, Aussie Yarns, which has got anecdotes and stories and, and history and poetry. Pass the ball and Yarns, Anecdotes and Memories by John McCauley. Uh, and the other one, which is pretty special actually, Bill McCauley. Uh, M.H. Bill McCauley. So, a little bit about uh, John and Bill. They're from, well, John's from Kilcoy, which is up in Queensland, inland from the Sunshine Coast, the southern end of the Sunshine Coast, like Caboolture Way. So if you're going to the Woodford Folk Festival from the Sunshine Coast or Brisbane, you just keep driving out and you'll come to Kilcoy. And if you keep on going out that way, then you get to say Crow's Nest or sort of what's the Raven's Born or something like that, Raven's Sage, I don't know. And um, Esk, uh, etc. Anyway, it's Yowie country. And um, the bridge there into uh, Kilcoy is actually named the uh, Bill, I think it is MH, Bill McCauley Bridge or something like that. So anyway, John's been a farmer most, well, all of his life, I believe, and his father was a bushy and uh, taught himself to read and write and um, became a bit of a bush poet himself. So I'm going to start tonight reading uh, Bill McCauley, the father, and I'll start by, so you're on the front, front cover here, you've got a picture of Bill, and it's a bit hard to see, but you've got John as a baby in, the, in his arms there. Now, so I'll read you about Bill first, a father's legacy. So, my father was born in 1917 and died at the age of 65 in 1985. He had a very fulfilling life, including being awarded an OBE for service to local government after being chairman of the local shire council for more than 20 years. It was during the years 1935 to 38 that he took to writing poetry. He never mentioned them to me, that's John. But thankfully, they were found in an exercise book, which is now in the possession of his sister, Mary Ann. The book is, uh, this book is a faithful reproduction of his poems, warts and all, as he wrote them down. Readers should keep in mind that he left the little country school he attended to work in a service station as soon as the law allowed him. By the time he was 17, he was living in a cottage in the mountains at Jimna, a small village about 30 kilometres from Kilcoy in South East Queensland. Quite often alone and sometimes with the son of his employer, a man a few years older than him, it was a lonely primitive existence with no electricity or other amenities and a weekly mail delivery, his only contact with the outside world other than in frequent trips to Kilcoy by horse. Fortunately, that mail delivery included a weekly copy of the Bulletin, a magazine which covered all aspects of Australian information from politics to news, arts, 
and the arts, including poetry. I can visualise him sitting at the table, poring over every page with the aid of a kerosene lamp. He always claimed that it was responsible for whatever education he ended up with, including his introduction to writing poems. An insight into how much he gained from reading it is clearly seen in his poem to The Bully. Again, fortunately, right from the start, he signed and dated almost everything he wrote. His first venture into writing was recorded in the exercise book, was a poem called Rosemary, dated 10.5.35, a couple of months before his 18th birthday. And the last was written the 11th of December, 1938. While that poem is a bit technically rough, I doubt any well educated modern 17 year old could do better for his ability to adduce pathos and sympathy from the reader. Many of the poems referred to people in his life, including in the last year, several referring to his mother, my mother, whom he married. Soon after that, the poem stopped. Others are about members of his family and work mates, while others are about the world around him. Once again, Evening in the Bush and Evening Breeze are reminiscent of Keats or Shelley. Uh, so, yeah, one of his earliest poems uh, is Last Ride, and this was written soon after his workmate, only workmate, and at Jimna, the son of his employer, was killed when a horse threw him against the tree, and it and the relic are particularly poignant. The reader will observe a constant religious flavour in the poems. Okay, I'm just going to cut it short there and I'm going to go straight into it. And yes, this is the one you mentioned, His Last Ride, which is, yeah, to his uh, friend who died. The young man entered the stockyard with a grim set smile on his face and balefully eyed the big roan horse as it poured upon up the dirt in the race. The horse was already saddled, the circingle and girth drawn tight, but he lingered yet in the stockyard in the hope of catching sight of the blue-eyed girl, his only love, who would come to bid him goodbye while the sun sank low westward in the sullen summer sky. And in his mind there lingered yet a day had not gone by when they said he was a coward if he refused to ride to Gundagai. Now, Gundagai was an outlaw bred, a killer of the lowest, meanest sort to try. To ride him was all new, a gamble with quick death fraud. He'd promised her he'd never ride an outlaw killer such as this, but the jeers of the bush folk led him on and she gave her consent with a kiss. All at once she was there beside him, her fair features framed with golden hair, her pale face trembling with awful doubt midst the dust of the stockyard there. But she knew for him it was the only way. His late lost honour to redeem and have his name marked down in gold on the scroll of the bushman's realm. She spake not, but her eyes said more than her lips ever could have said. You know, Ken, life alone is not worthwhile. Then slowly, sadly, bent her head. He stopped, stooped and kissed her tenderly, for an instant paused and then climbed briskly upon the race as he heard a whisker whisper, Goodbye, Ken. When all was set, he gave the word for the boys to open the gate. Out of it bounded the big roan horse, the bundle of fury, fire and hate. He rooted and snorted and squealed, he bucked and reared and shied and was lost to sight as he topped the hill and made for the ranges wide. 
The summer night came quickly on and the evening light grew dim, grew, grew dim. And kneeling there in the stockyard dusk, a pale-faced woman prayed for him. But as the stars shone out, and he came not back, so she went slowly out for him to seek her pale lips quavering with pain and fear, while the tears rolled down her cheek. She found him out there in the ranges, by the light of the stars and the moon, Old Gundagai had another kill and turned a woman's life to ruin. That's a sad one, eh? That was probably a good way to start. Now, now as, as I mentioned earlier, in Bill uh, lived a lot of his early life up in Jimna, in the bush, and he hardly even got out and in, in rarely even got down to kill Koi. Well, this is called Brisbane First Impressions, written on the 20th of February 1937. So there's a bit of context for you. So this is a young man going down into Brisbane, the age of about 18, uh, 20 actually, and his first impressions of Brisbane in 1937. Wow. I've been to see this city of yours, and naturally, I was surprised. With you punkers and fans and plush-covered floors, which is better than I had surmised. Huge stores, wherein one may easily get lost, where one finds drapery, hardware and pies, articles being sold at less than their cost. It's sure enough opened me eyes. Strange little counters all over the place, covered in all sorts of trash. Uh, each little counter a sweet, smiling face, an incentive to spend all your cash. You get carried along in the hurrying throng while everyone seems to note the smell of gum leaves is still on you strong. Perhaps it's the way that you like. Electric trams dash along past you quickly. Cars charge you from any old side. When you move, you have to move slickly in crossing those streets so darn wide. One day was all I had of this, and one day I reckon's quiet enough. Back home, my nerves are all a miss, and I thought I was pretty tough. So you're going to have your city with its girls so pretty, plus its human toil and strife. Just give me the land without your pity. Lead, let me lead a clean, calm life. Bill McCauley, 20th of February, 1937. Now here at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame, these books will go into our... Australian Poetry Library and Archive, and I am collecting a rather large collection, an extensive collection of Australian poetry, including really transient stuff like this that there might only be a few copies of. So if you've got poetry or poetry books you'd like to donate to the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame, or your own poetry even, then send them to 144 Bradley Street, Gyra, the care of me, Thundercloud, you know, James at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame, of course. All right. This one's called My Pal, and his name was Dick. The mountains all around me, like life's trouble on me pressed. Enemies, they try to hound me, while I try to do me best. With this life so empty now that my truest friend has gone, for with his death I made a vow which I'll keep, though still I mourn. For this friend who is now sleeping, who was in my life, who in life was my advisor and my pal, is now in the Lord's safe keeping. I'll keep my vow, I must, I shall. And my dear friend in, up there in heaven, but whose counsel here on earth remains, shall keep my honest vow shall ease its hurts and share its pains. 
And now that he's gone and I am left here on this earth beneath, he'll hear when I shall say a prayer. He'll see when I shall pray, place a wreath upon his grave. And when I meet him up above, he'll be just the same old pal I know, full of kindness, help and love. When the time comes, when I must go. Composed by Bill McCauley, the 25th of August, 1937. And yes, it's the 28th of August, 2023. Now, all right, next one. Okay, is the poem called Dick. Tireless in life when work had to be done. Fearless in strife, his dad's only son. Worshipped by some of us, loved by us all, ready and willing, he answered the call. Happy and gay, his comrades were many. Honest and true, he owed not a penny. Faithful in love and loved for his worth, he left without leaving a bad friend on earth. Happy in death by his creator, called home. On his last breath, he sailed to heaven and home there to watch over us and help us each one. The son of his father, his father's true to son. Pray for us, old comrade, and help us along. Our burden is heavy, we're not very strong. That cross that our father has given us to bear will lead us to heaven and your home up there. For our sins they are many and virtues are few, so pray for us, comrade. Teach us what to do. The light of this world has grown dim and grey since you, by our Father, were taken away. That's Dick by Bill McCauley. Oh, well, look, I was not going to do this, but I'll skip that. But since I mentioned it in the beginning, the, to the bully. So this is to the bulletin. The beer is on, the damp is cooked and through the bulletin. I've looked and scanned the grey cartoons. I've read the jokes and their sly pokes at politicians and some other blokes, especially the one that croons. I've read the Abelard's lies about sheep and men and birds and flies. Gosh, how those chaps must float. I've read the literary review and what the other fellow knew, what Ajax paid out on the tote. I've read how Palmer beat our Ron and the latest score compiled by Don. The rowing news, it wasn't much. I see where Crawford beat young Quist and who Bob Taylor lately kissed and saw a drawing by dear such. And Lindsay did this time do well in depicting Germany as hell with her Hitler as old Nick. All this I learned for just a Zach. That's not much in this outback, so the bulletin I'll stick. That was written on the 20th of March, 1938. Mm. So 1938, yeah, interesting line. And Lindsay did this time do well in depicting Germany as hell with Herr Hitler as old Nick. Mmm. All right, this one was written on the 25th of uh, March, 1938. This is called Doreen. Now, um, what was his name? C.J. Dennis wrote a lot of poems about Doreen. It was a bit of a popular name back in the day, not so common now. <coughs> Way up there in Charters Towers in the hot tropical north, mid the sick bed and the flowers, my thoughts are shooting forth. And they hover over a figure as she moves among the beds, tending patient, small and bigger, stroking feverish heads. A tender heart is full of pity, a tear shines in her eye. She tries hard to be gritty when she'd much sooner cry. She listens to a strong man's groans, a newborn baby's wail. She heals their wounds and broken bones. Florist, Florence Nightingale. 
Okay, that was that. Uh, next one's not dated or signed, so it's just called Justice. The squatter stood at the pearly gate, his face was worn and old. He meekly asked the man of fate, Admission to the fold? What have you done, St Peter cried, to gain admission here? Said he, I own the Queensland run for many a droughty year. The gate swung open sharply. St Peter touched a bell. Come in, young man, and take a harp. You've had enough of hell. Not dated or signed, just called justice. And uh, the last one is about a horse. And it's called the nightmare. He's out there lying on the cold, wet ground, his foreleg all smashed and broken. His pain-filled eyes are staring round, but still they retain their token. Of his trust so deep, so all-enduring, that he forever gave to me. When he was young, I took it assuring him twould ever scare it be, sacred be. The summer evening's quickly fading, the sun is sinking dull, dull red. Still love for my horse is shading, thoughts of mercy he'd be better dead. Memories come crowding upon me of the good times we had, he and I. The sights are blurred, I can hardly see through the teardrops in my eye. I waken, cold sweat stands upon my brow. A hideous nightmare, an awful dream, I thankfully realise it now. Thank God things are not always what they seem. Mm. So that is a bush, some of a Bushy's Ballads by M.H. Bill Macaulay. All right. <clears throat> now I'm going to uh, move on to John Macaulay, his son, who was in here with his wife, Lynn, just the other day. So the first book that uh, John wrote here, uh, about the author. It's probably the first book he wrote, yeah. He's uh, recently retired after almost 30 years in the dairy industry and politics. Uh, he was possessed by an urge to record the major events which have shaped his life. He's presented in an unusual way using humour, history and personal philosophy to tell his story. Uh, these has got, there's also more than 50 self-written poems in here mostly. Um, to break the monotony of his memoirs. And tonight, I'm just only going to be reading out uh, the poetry because it's uh, chill on Tuesday, poet cast, and that's all I have time to do. But I've got certainly a lot here to read out of the poetry from John Macaulay. The Realist. The ex this experience and the unrealistic expectations of people I've dealt with in all my other activities led me to put my thoughts to paper. All right. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> the realist. The optimist said to the pessimist as the storm clouds built in the sky, I think that at last we'll see some rain and end to this two-year dry I notice the ants are building their nests an inch above the ground. It's been like this for so long now. Our turn must come around. The pessimist said to the optimist, oh, You must be soft in the head. Those clouds will blow away again. The rest of our stock will be dead. Those ants are building lookout towers. It's a drink they're searching for. It's been like this for so long now. It's bound to continue some more. The optimist said to the pessimist, well, the prices are good at least. The dollar's down, demand is up for milk and grain and beast. When we get some rain and grow some feed, we'll make some dough at last. With cash to spare and prospects bright, we'll soon forget the past. The pessimist said to the optimist, don't you read or observe on TV? The world's in recession, we're on the way down, we'll soon be on our knees. 
with mad cow disease to threaten our cheese and force us to sell at a loss. You optimists tend to make me feel sick with your constant attempts to add gloss. The optimist said to the pessimist, well, the wife and kids are well. We've built on the numbers and added one more since last time some decent rain fell. We'll soon have enough to do all the work and that she and I now have to do now. And we can retire and sit in the shade while our underlings milk all our cows. The pessimist said to the optimist, well, ours give us nothing but strife. They worry us sick, cost us too much. They're really the bane of my life. I suppose when they're older and get on the dole, things might pick up a bit. But if Howard gets back and cuts our support, things will be worse where we sit. Now, a realist happened to listen to this and thoughts quickly grew in his head. Thank God I've got balance, a sensible mind and a steady approach instead. Because somewhere between their various views lies the outlook that we all need as we search for a system to govern our lives in thought and manner and deed. To earn on the side of either one here is something we must never do. We should look on the bright side but always consider the downside of everything too. So when people say, what's your belief? Are you Christian, Muslim or do you? I always reply, I'm a realist, mate, but our number is sadly a few. All right, now, when John was here, he read one of his poems, A Farmer's Wife, but later on he reflect, he recited this one, and this is called She Who Must Be Obeyed, and some. Um, an ode to Rumpold of the Baby Bailey on ABC. Um, and it was written while he was driving between Crow's Nest and Toowoomba one morning between meetings, pulling off the road every time I had a few lines in his head, and has recently been selected for publication for a competition. All right. Have you ever heard of Rumpole of old Bailey fame? He was on the screen of Channel 2. He earned his famous name. He had a favourite saying that became his stock in trade. He always called his missus. She who must be obeyed. Now, all of us who live with in a state of married bliss will doubtless understand his use of statements such as this. It started with our mothers and we would be afraid when she said, jump, we said, how high to she who must be obeyed. When teething rings and childhood things were swapped for bands of gold, we thought we would have freedom now that we were old. Uh -uh, not so. And now, every now, and hair is gone or grayed. It's still a fact we can't ignore. Is she who must be obeyed. Oh, you can try to wield some power and kick over the traces and run the risk of to life and limb that such an act embraces. And when you've lost uh, all male hopes, you've shamelessly betrayed She'll sit there and in control will she who must be obeyed. The answer, it's simple. If you want to live in heaven, just learn to do what you're told right from the age of seven. And all at once there'll be no fights, no nastiness displayed. You will find that life is great with she who must be obeyed. There you go. All right, now moving on to this one here, Yarns, Anecdotes and Memories by John McCauley. 
Now, so Latour de Kilcoy. Um, so yeah, actually, Yao is right. This yarn is based on reality. I do actually conduct tours of Kilcoy as described. And this poetry, you know, this is pretty close to reality. Maybe the characters are exaggerated, but their skepticism about Yao is as normal. This is the poem I read them before stepping off the bus to thunderous applause. Well, a few gentle claps, actually. Yes, I believe in Yowies. Yeah, well, I believe in Yowies. It's clear as day to me. The proof is irrefutable. And their fraud to see of Bigfoots, Yetis, Bunyips, the stories all abound and proof of their existence is strewn all around. What's that? You think it's bull and just a lot of rot? That all of us believers are a wacky bloody lot? Well, think again, you cynics, because I'm here to take you on and prove to you beyond all doubt that Yowie's aren't a con. Around the gym, the rangers, their roaring can be heard. And every now and then a hiker steps on a Yowie turd. The wallabies all round bound away. The dingoes cringe in fear. Whenever thumping footsteps tell them a Yowie must be near. Their scary three-toed footprints measure two feet long at least, far bigger than a kangaroo or any other beast. The shaggy hair they leave behind retains a putrid stink. There is no other explanation. They are the missing link. Now, if you're still a doubter, look around you everywhere. They are plenty of examples in them in their modern lair. In parliaments and unions, unions in footy teams and pubs, in gangster dens and boardrooms and in rebel bikey clubs. You'll find today's example of their urge to interbreed as they mated with us humans and just where that deed can lead to challenges before you take another, take a look at one another. The signs are everywhere, I say, of a yaoi dad or mother. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now, this is his most recent book published in uh, 2010, I think, 11, yeah. And <clears throat> it's a series of anecdotes and stories and yarns. It's called Aussie Yarns. It's all quite factual. They're very interesting stories within this. Um, however, I'm, again, I'm just reading the poetry. Now, Farmer's Wife explained, I've come across some women like Mandy over the years, but doubt any one of them ever escaped the passage she did. They're probably still rearing calves, fishing pumps, waiting for that holiday to arrive. The following poem is one that I wrote years ago for a mate who was getting married. It inspired the story. A Farmer's Wife. There's... Something you'll need to know now, now that you've tied the knot. As time goes on, as you will see, you'll have to learn a lot. To become the wedded partner in our comfy little nest may not turn out to be the lifestyle you had guessed. But as the groom, I made a pact to love and not to harm her, but the problem is, as you well know, I'm through and through a farmer. And I will need a hand sometimes in a business that's depressed to do some jobs to help me out. A few. I'll do the rest. If you can get the cows in while you're on your way to town and shift the fence and check to see if that old cow's still down, don't forget to fill the car and pick up the seat I bought. I don't know what I did before I found this bonza saw. If you could do the milking for an hour or two at most, you'd still have time to mow the lawn, peel spuds and cook a roast. As you're the smart one of us too, it's you who would be best to help the kids with homework, that's all. I'll do the rest. The automatic washer will save you lots of time. 
So you can do the vacuuming, uh, mop dirt and dust and grind. And ironing's done one handed, so the other hand is free to do the bookwork for the farm. Well, you're good at it, you see. There are so many jobs on farms where a bloke just needs a hand, from drafting cows to fixing pump to carting loads of sand. I know I must take care of you and not leave you depressed. So after you've done that lot, you stop. I'll do the rest. You really need a preg test. You watch, I'll show you how. The garden is all up to you, but call me. Ah, oh, and if you're careful with the gears, I'll teach you how to plow. A woman's patience is required to rear the cows on suckers and horses broken in by girls, well, seldom turn out buckers. I'm not much good at gardening because I don't have a green thumb. The garden is all up to you, but call me and I'll come. There are so many jobs around in which you are the best, so you should handle all of them. Well, me, I'll do the rest. Do I complain? When I come in and breakfast running late? No, I simply read the paper while I'm forced away. <clears throat> it just means that this morning you'll have less time to do the jobs I've listed for you and there's more than just a few. Now, I'm not a wife abuser and I know it's only fair to even out the workload and for me to do my share. That's why when you've done those things, and met my last request. Why don't you put your feet up? Dear, relax. I'll do the rest. Mm. Yeah. Oh, a bit dry. Right, uh, that's funny. True, too, very true. Farmers' wives work just as hard as farmers. All right, this one's called Best Friends. It's not hard to see when you look at this pair. They both share a love that is sadly too rare. Developed from friendship and forged through the years of childhood, adulthood and in good times and tears. Overcome the trials of life and it's rough, help build up their characters, gentle but tough. Put steel in their backbone, love in their heart, not lost, only strengthened by years apart. Fate had decreed that their paths seldom crossed. On life's stormy seas, they were savaged and tossed. That time in between when they drifted apart never dimmed for a minute the love in their heart. One was destined to end up as a wife, the other to live a more solitary life. But as time slipped by and neared life's end, they still reached out to their very best friend. Hmm. Okay, and we've got one more for you of John Macaulay's poems. Actually, I've got two here. I'm going to do the relic first. It hangs there on a nail in the wall. It had been abused, as I can recall, hanging there, covered in cobwebs and dust. Memory it stirs of a man one can trust, still showing signs from the sweat of his brow and the faint hoof marks of an old belly cow. It recalls busy scenes midst, mid stockyard and dust, and a friend who's gone where everyone must. It's a link from the past I cannot forget, a link with a friend the truest I've met. As I enter the door, my always, eyes always fall on the battered old hat hanging there on the wall. Mm. The relic, yeah. Mm. And that one actually was written by his father, Bill McCauley. So this was not written by John McCauley here. That's actually out of um, the other book. And the one I'm going to read to you now is also Bill McCauley, but it's in this John McCauley. It's his father, Evening in the Bush. The fiery sun had set 
and all was quiet and still, as slow and timid as a cat, the moon crept over the hill. The evening breeze had murmured and whispered as it went, and on its gentle passing, I caught its own sweet scent. The hint of hidden flowers, heads bowed in peaceful sleep, in some secluded secret place where shadows softly creep. The moon climbed slowly higher, while starlight twinkles out, like embers glowing in a fire, God's campsite without doubt. The huge trees gently swayed before the evening breeze. The possums all out playing, no more hum of bees. Afar a dingo howling and searching for its prey. Upon the hill an owl hoots, then blinks and flies away. The rung bark trees all standing as if in silent prayer. I watch a luckless moth land in the spider's cunning snare. A horse bell gently tinkles, a cow lows for a calf. The clouds roll in and wrap the moon in a silken scarf. Drudop, dew drops start to glisten on leaves that quietly nod. I sit here and I listen. I have had a glimpse of God. And that was by Bill McCauley on the 5th of the 5th, 1938. Okay, well, that's it from me here on Chillin' Tuesday podcast at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame on this 29th of August. 2023. Yes. <clears throat> Stay tuned tomorrow night. I'll be putting up the Wednesday words. Uh, Wednesday words. Open my poetry night. And if you're in Gyra tomorrow night, just get down there. 6.30. Why not? Come and listen. You don't have to be a poet to come and listen and show it and appreciate it. Yeah. No. It's great. All right. If you'd like this tonight, listening to John McCauley and Bill McCauley's poems, Give it a thumbs up. Do that now. Like, it doesn't matter even if you didn't. Just take it a thumbs down. But give it a thumbs up because it helps the metrics, helps other people find this. And also, as well as that, if you leave a comment, like somewhere in, like, commenting on the wonderful poetry or something, then it helps the metrics too. And then other people find the video. Look, I'm Thundercloud. Don't forget, November 12th to the 19th here in Gaira Poets on the Mountain Festival, which includes the Australian Bush Poets Association, New South Wales Bush Poetry Championship, both written and performance. And you can find the link down below. As well as that, I'm also open, we're open for submissions on filmfreeway.com, the Australian Poetry Competition, the Australian Bush Poetry Film Festival. So if you want to make a submission and to that and be in the running for prizes, etc., etc., and to be the winner of the inaugural first ever Australian Bush Poetry Film Festival, well, this is your opportunity. You just have to get your phone and record yourself doing a poem. Like, that's the simplest way or you get someone to record you, or you get a professional filmmaker to record you to make a film about your bush poetry poem. Whatever, it doesn't matter. It's open creativity here. Yes, that's what we are. We're creative poets, but we're multifaceted creatives. All right, so check the links down below. There'll be a link to the event page at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame, a link to the downloads page so you can get the entry forms for the Bush Poetry uh, Performance and Written Championship, and also a link to Film Freeway where you can make your submission to the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame, uh, the Australian Bush Poetry Film Festival. And there'll be more information down below in the description. Lots of love on Thundercloud, washing away the garbage, leaving rainbows after rains. We've had our fun. We've had our linguistic games. And I'll be back tomorrow night with more. 
What more could you want? But more poetry. Why not? Because poetry is awesome. It's really interesting. Like each poet has their own unique perspective of each event, and it's got emotionality and and it's sort of condensed and it's, it's lovely. And and there are just and each poem is a different story. And I've got over two thousand poetry books out there, and it's growing and growing and growing. And each poetry book has hundred or so less, more or less poems in it, and they're just stories. That's like so many poems and stories. Amazing. Look, I love poetry, and I know you do too. So if you can support the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame in Gaira, that would be fantastic. And just also down below, in the link below, is the link to our GoFundMe campaign, because we've got this Bush Poetry Championship coming up, and I need sponsors, because I've got to give out prizes to these poets, you know, and I've got to run a festival. So if you're a sponsor, and you were, or a normal human, and you would like to donate to the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame and the New South Wales Bush Poetry Championship, so it runs and it's fantastic. Well, see the link below as well. All right, I'm Thundercloud, and I'm whooshing out of here. Boom. See you later.